Let's take out our Bibles and learn together. When it comes to humanity, and I'm speaking about both Jew and Gentile, we all have something in common. Left to ourselves, we are heading for experiencing the wrath of God. Now, we learned last week, is there an advantage for having the Torah? Yes, there is. It is God's revelation. And therefore, with that, we can have a greater understanding of what one needs to do. But the Torah itself, as we'll see later on, the Torah is not an instrument that brings about redemption. It doesn't change our spiritual condition. And that's true, Jew or Gentile. We, left to ourselves, are in the same situation. We are heading for God's wrath. And in regard to humanity, there is only one way, and I want to emphasize that fact. There is only one way. If there's any other way that we experience God's forgiveness, His mercy, that we can enter into a relationship with Him and be received into His kingdom, if there's any other way, you know what that means? It means that all the suffering, what Yeshua did for you and me, when he was mocked, spat upon, beaten, flogged, and crucified, all of that could have been avoided. We could have done another way. So it is most insulting to Yeshua to believe that there are a multiplicity of ways into the kingdom of God. There is not. There is only one way, and it's the gospel. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Romans and chapter 3. The book of Romans and chapter 3. Now, for the last several studies, we've been seeing Paul and he speaks of both Jew and Gentile. His purpose is to speak concerning humanity. And there is a tendency among some to believe, well, because of that covenant, that, that calls the Jewish people the people of God, that they are in some way exempt from receiving the gospel. Absolutely not. The gospel was given to Israel first for their well-being, for them to be redeemed, and then secondly, to take that message of redemption and share it with all the world. Listen to what Paul says here concerning the spiritual condition of all humanity, both Jew and Gentile. We're going to begin in Romans chapter 3 and verse 9. He begins by posing a question. He says, what therefore? He wants us to give consideration. And he asks, are we better? Now, Paul being Jewish, he's speaking about the Jewish community. And he simply says, are we based upon the fact that we're Jewish? Are we better? Are we in some spiritual preference before God? And the answer is, and he says it, he says, no, not at all. Strong words. And then he reminds the reader of what he's already spoken of earlier. And that is, as has been stated, that which has been, has been demonstrated earlier, he says, for both the Jews and the Greeks, meaning the Gentiles, all are under sin. Now, that phrase, under, so frequently, means judgment. We are under sin, meaning we are going to receive judgment because of sin. Who? Makes no difference. Jew and Gentile, we all are sinful, therefore left to ourselves. There is no hope. We are heading and realize if you have not received the gospel, I assure you, you are on a pathway that's moving quickly to receiving God's eternal wrath. And again, the only way to avoid that is through the gospel. What Messiah has done. Now, he says we're under sin, under the judgment that sin is going to bring about also, we can understand this as under the influence of sin. When God looks at humanity today, he sees sin. 
Sin brings about death. Sin, God will judge. And therefore, there's only one way that we can escape God's judgment. You see, the Bible reveals that Messiah, who knew no sin, he was perfectly righteous. See, the only ones that are going to be in the kingdom of God are the righteous. It speaks about open up the gates of righteousness. Why? So the righteous can enter in. Well, left to ourselves. We're not righteous. We are stained, we are corrupted with sin. Sin dominates, sin leads us. We make sinful decisions by ourselves. Now, the revelation of God, our conscience can help, but in the end, our sinfulness will dominate whatever our conscience says to us. We are without hope. Our conscience does not save us. It does not bring about an acceptable change. It tells us oftentimes what is right, what may be God's expectations. The Torah does it better. Yes, the Torah is superior to the conscience of humanity. But left to ourselves, we are not righteous. And this is what the gospel reveals. Messiah, when he was on that cross, it says that he took upon himself. It was taken from us and all the sins of humanity, all sin, all iniquity, all transgressions were placed upon him. And when he died, remember the correlation between sin and death, he became sin in our behalf. He died in our behalf. And as our sins were going upon him, what happened? His righteousness. How righteous is he? Perfectly righteous. And therefore, his righteousness was placed upon us. That's the benefit of when you receive the gospel. The righteousness of the only begotten son who was perfect. His righteousness is placed upon us. That's why we can have absolute assurance. We can be confident that because the righteousness of the son of God is upon us, we can have confidence. We have a hope that will not disappoint that God will welcome us into his kingdom because he sees not all of my sinfulness. That's been taken away. He sees the perfect righteousness of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, gives us that wonderful assurance. So Paul is saying now that we are all under sin in our normal, in our natural state, both Jew and Gentile. Look now at verse 10. One of the things I like about the New Testament is that it's constantly quoting the Old Testament. It says, just as it has been written. And what is written in the Old Testament? That there is not one who is righteous. No, not one. Makes it pretty clear. When we look at all of humanity, this includes the prophets, Moses, everyone, of course, except for Yeshua. He is the only one who is righteous, the only begotten son of God. But all other individuals throughout all of history, we are all sinful. As he says, there is no one righteous. No, not one. He goes on. Look now to the next verse. Verse 11. There is not, and then he uses a phrase, one that understands. So there is not one that understands. There is not one that is seeking God. Now, it's interesting because the construction, and I won't go into all the grammatical laws, but the construction here about one who is seeking God, it's used in a grammatical way that speaks of a description. There is no one who can rightly be described as seeking, as pursuing God. Why? Because sin dominates. We are under the influence of sin. That original sin that we were born with, it dominates us. We don't have understanding. We are not seeking God. Verse 12, all, and it is an inclusive word, all, meaning all of humanity, all have turned aside. Now, this word for turning aside, it speaks of a, a, a detour. It's a, a 
doing something that deviates from the proper. So we all have deviated from that which is right, that which is proper. Instead of going on the right way, we've turned aside. Who's done that? All. All have turned aside. All together, they have become. And this next word is translated a variety of ways. It means someone who has become corrupt. Someone because of that state of corruption. Think of it this way. Food, which is spoiled, it's rotten. Can it be used? It cannot. If you eat it, it will make you sick. And that's what this word is speaking about. We all, all together, have become corrupt. There's no value. There's no profit in it whatsoever. We all have become corrupt. He says that there is no one who's doing what? Who is doing, and this next word is so significant. It's the word that probably is translated many places in the Bible with the concept of kindness. Now, I believe many translate it good, but it's not the normal word for good. It has at its core the word for grace. No one is gracious. No one is kind. What it speaks about this. We are called to be the children of God, but none of us, and this is what it means, none of us are reflecting the character of God. We're not thinking like God thinks. We're not behaving like God behaves. We're doing nothing. And it's simply to show that none of us are demonstrating that we belong to God. Why? Because we do not have, naturally, a covenant with God of reconciliation. Now, we need to understand that that covenant that God made with Israel and praise Him for that, it's a wonderful covenant. It's a powerful covenant. But that initial covenant is not a covenant of restoration or reconciliation with God. Meaning that initial covenant does not deal with the problem of sin. It doesn't deal with Jewish sin or Gentile sin. It is only the new covenant that is a covenant of reconciliation, a covenant founded in redemption, a covenant that brings about a relationship. What type of relationship with God? An eternal relationship with God. So he says here, there is no one doing kindness. There is not even one. So he emphasizes it. You look, it doesn't matter what time in history, where you look, there is no one who is kind. No, not one. Verse 13. Now he describes humanity from God's perspective. How do I know from God's perspective? Because he's quoting scripture here. He says, verse 13. Their throat is an open grave. Their tongues speak deception. So not a flattering statement. Who is he making it about? Humanity. All people. Our throats are an open grave. Now you fall in, it's dangerous. An open grave is dangerous. And an open grave, any grave is corrupt, meaning it is of, of spiritual impurity. And then it says, their tongues literally make do what is deceitful, not speaking truth. And then he closes out this 13th verse with a, another easy example to understand. He says, the venom of a viper or an asp, it's speaking about a type of snake. It says, the venom of of a, a snake, a dangerous snake, is under their lips. Verse 14. Whose mouth and Israel was supposed to be an instrument of blessing. In fact, humanity, if we're doing what God wants, we are going to be blessing. But what it says here is the exact opposite. It says, whose mouth is cursing. Not speaking kindness, not speaking the things that we ought, but a very, very disappointing fact. Whose mouth curses and is full of bitterness. Now, I believe that last part where it says the mouth is also full of bitterness is most informing. 
We are unhappy. Why? Well, there's conflict in this world. And the epistle from Yaakov, and I'm speaking about James in the New Testament, James clearly reveals why. He asks the question, where does conflicts and wars come from? And we see that in a small sense, just a conflict between two individuals and a conflict between many people that leads to wars. He says it's very simple. I want something, I don't get it, you're in my way, and therefore conflict. That's the basis of it. It can be on a large scale or a small one, but full of conflict. And we see here, just not conflict, but notice what else he says. Look now to verse 15. Light, and we can maybe translate that as most English Bibles do, swift. Their feet are swift to shed or to spill blood. Now, this is talking about the outcome. We've already stated, and we see this throughout the scripture, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. What ultimately does sin bring about? Well, the day we sin, death comes, death rings. And so he's speaking about here simply that our feet are swift to shed blood. And notice something today. In many countries, we're seeing the death rate, meaning murder, is on the rise. You look at most major cities, not just in America, but throughout the world. I live in Israel. The same is true here. The number of murders are increasing throughout the world. And it's just as a way of showing the corruption of humanity. Things aren't getting better. Things are getting worse. And the scripture, according to the prophets, things are going to get much worse. So their feet are swift to shed blood. And then we have in verse, verse 16 where it says, my translated calamity, destruction, we're talking about something that is a catastrophe from a godly perspective. And it says, destruction, and this next word is a strong word of sorrow, or maybe better translated with the word misery. So destruction and misery is in their ways. Meaning this, as we follow, as we are led by the influence of sin, we are heading to destruction and misery. And that word misery speaks of intense suffering from two standpoints, physically, but also emotionally. It's misery in a very inclusive manner. That's where you're heading left to yourself. Now, if you say, I reject that gospel, it's not for me, that's your future. Realize you're choosing that today. When you say no to Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ, you are saying, I want, I'm inviting destruction and misery into my life. Now, you may escape a lot of that in this world, but don't be deceived. In the world to come on judgment, you will experience that destruction and misery, that sorrow, what the scripture calls weeping, and the gnashing of teeth, weeping, sorrow, gnashing of teeth, intense pain. That's what happens when one says no to God's provision, his provision of forgiveness, his provision of grace. And that comes only through faith in Messiah Yeshua, what he's done. So we read, look now at the next verse, verse 17. And the way of peace, they did not know. They simply don't know the way of peace. They know corruption. They know bitterness. They know cursing. The way of peace, they can't find. Why? Because peace is inherently related to the will of God. And you will never be in God's will until first you're redeemed. That's why the scripture speaks about one being lost. They're lost spiritually. They're not heading in the right way. They're in the way of 
misery, corruption, destruction, conflict, murder, shedding of blood. They are full of bitterness, not joy. The only way that we can get on that right way is through faith in the gospel. So the way of peace they have not known. And look at the end of, of the, this section, verse 18. It says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. This is what he's speaking about. They are not giving, and the word fear has to do with priority. They are not, and they have not, they are not, and they are not going to make God's priority the center of their life. Let me just speak to you very clearly. If you are not committed to the things that are God's priorities, what His will is, you are foolish. And you are going to reap the eternal consequences of that. There's only one way to change. Now, you might say, many of this I don't agree with. This is not where I am. Of course it's not. Because you haven't been redeemed. But when you say yes to the gospel, acknowledging, yes, I'm sinful. And yes, I trust in the work of Messiah on the cross. I believe he died for my sin. I believe that God raised him from the dead. You invite him into your life. And you're going to see how your life changes rapidly. You will go through a major change in every aspect of your life. Make that decision. It is the wisest decision that one can make. So he says here, simply, there is no fear of God before their eyes. We need to have a perspective. That's what it means about before their eyes. They are not seeing things as they should. They don't see the priorities of their life, and therefore they make the wrong decisions. See, when we make godly decisions, when his priority is what we're pursuing, then we're going to have the right perspective and make good decisions. Look now at verse 19. New subject, but related. He says, but we know. Now he's talking here once more to the Jewish community, and he's sharing it. With the non-Jew, he says, but we know that what the law says. And he's talking about the revelation of God's word. Now, we sometimes see the Torah as just those commandments in the first five books. But we see biblically, Paul, for example, elsewhere. He uses the term law and he quotes from Isaiah. He's talking about God's revelation. So look again, he says, but we know. That whatever the law says to the ones in the law, meaning that are with the law, are committed to it, it speaks in order that every mouth shall be close. Meaning this, when we look at the word of God and see his expectations for what it means to be righteous, see the law, the Torah is not an instrument of, of redemption it doesn't make me righteous but the law informs me of the proper definition of what is right the righteousness of god i learned that i don't experience it i don't become that but it defines what is righteous and therefore when i listen to what the law says it shuts me up because i know i'm not look now at verse 19 the second half it says and under judgment, and it's the judgment of God, has become all the world. All the world, every Jew, every Gentile. We are heading left to ourselves. We are heading to the judgment of God. And notice it says, upodikos, under the judgment of God, who? All the world. Therefore, now let's look at our last verse, verse 20. Therefore, very important statement. Therefore, from the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Now, this just tells us what I said earlier. The law was never given as an instrument of justification. It's not what I do. If it was, how much is necessary? What is enough good deeds to qualify? There's nothing in the scripture that relates to a certain number. Because it's not based upon 
deeds. It is not found through good deeds, justification. What does he say? Very clearly, look again. Therefore, from the works of the law, not any, that's literally what it says. It has the word all and then the negative. Not any flesh will be justified before him. The law never was given as an instrument of making one righteous. It tells us something very different. Look now to, to the last part of the verse. It says, for through the law, now we're going to learn the purpose of the law. For through the law comes what? Through the law is the knowledge of sin. That's what he tells us. So the law, first and foremost, its first and primary purpose, it defines what is righteous, what is the will of God, what God expects from us, and that expectation is a demand, not negotiable. The law teaches us what God expects, demands from us. When we learn that, we find out, oh, I'm in trouble. I'm not doing these things. And I'm heading for God's judgment. He's displeased with me. But nevertheless, God is a God of love. We see that in the sacrificial service. And the ultimate sacrifice, in fact, the only sacrifice that truly redeems eternally, all the others just foreshadow. They point to their instruments of teaching. But the only sacrifice that eternally redeems us, that wipes away all of our sin, iniquity, transgressions from before God, and bestows upon us eternal righteousness, is the sacrifice of Messiah. When he died, specifically on Passover, the day of redemption, he died on that day in order to redeem us eternally, from all of our sin, that we could have an eternal relationship with God and that we could be people that belong to his kingdom. Good news. And if you accept it, you will have that good news forever and ever. Well, I'll close with that. Shalom.